Great. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for Landscaping and Gardening for Wildlife with the Mass Audubon. Do you have a true green thumb? Meaning, are you taking into account the complete ecosystem around the land that you care for? We're going to learn how you can support local species by utilizing wildlife friendly gardening practices in your home, business and community settings. Simple, easy actions like keeping fall leaves on the ground could have huge effects and bring in more butterflies come spring. We're going to learn about what to do and not to do in your yard, garden or even container to support nearby birds, frogs, pollinators and in a more sustainable fashion. And uh, this uh, presentation is led by Tia Pinney, who's a biologist, lead naturalist, and uh, educator at Mass Audubon's Drumlin Farm Wildlife Sanctuary in Lincoln uh, since 1994. Um, when, she was when she first started working at the farm, uh, Tia has overseen efforts to maintain New England's wildlife on its 206 acre property, managing staff and volunteers in planting projects and citizen science. So all uh, 65 of us or so who are here live and the many more that will watch on demand, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Tia for joining us here this morning. And Tia, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you, Robert. I appreciate it. Okay, so here we go, folks. We've got a number of slides to get through and I wanna get through them in time to have some questions at the end. So I'm going to uh, mosey, mosey along, but do, do let Robert know if you miss something or if something needs to be repeated. Um, you will get a link to this later that you can, you can review if you need to. There's lots to talk about. This is, this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart. So, so off we go. Um, so what we're going to do for the for this morning, I'm so used to saying this evening, um, we're going to talk about what sustainability and what it is. We're going to talk about supporting our wildlife, the best practices for doing so, the role of native plants versus introduced um, species, um, the issue of lawns, and then uh, you know it, what what should you do if you if you feel you need or you want water, um, and what's the importance of water. So. Those are our top, that, that's, our, that's our roadmap for the night. I mean, the day, sorry. Off we go. So first, sustainability. So, you know, it's, that's, a, that's a total buzzword right now. What is sustainability? You know, um, it's, a, it's a very, it's a term that we, that we hear a lot. Um, in regards to our own, and in, in thinking about it in terms of, of a natural history, ecosystem, ecological perspective, I would say that you know everything that we everything about our natural environment needs to be considered. Um, it's a, it's living in a way that maintains the health and integrity of the environment. Um, <clears throat> about you know ensuring future generations um, of people and of wildlife and plants all have access to the natural resources that we need. Um, and that you know we're all we're all in this boat together, humans in balance with nature, um, to ensure the future. Um, and why is sustainability so important at this point? This is this is by the way a terrific image from Charlie Harper. I don't know if you know Charlie Harper. He's an artist who died many years ago, but he did he was he was basically a naturalist himself, and he has these terrific graphic images that are just gorgeous. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So. The thing is, is that it's sustainability is important right now because of the stress that we are seeing on many of our natural systems. Um, you know, we've, I don't, a few years ago, there was a release of a report that we've lost, you know, billions of birds from North America, um, probably a 30% decline in, in birds in, in Massachusetts alone, since most of us are in the, in the Northeast here, outside of New Mexico. Um, and likely up to a 70% decline in insects in, in that same time frame. Um, the issue is that birds are, are much more highly counted and, and, and moderated, I mean monitored than, than insects. So we don't really, you know, the insect population is, is a loss, decline is, is not numerical. Although remember, I'm old enough to remember when I was a kid and in the spring, I mean, in the summer, you know, the windshield would be covered with dead bugs, right? When you go out in the evening in particular, there would, there would just be mushed bugs all over your windshield. And now, no mushed bugs, right? And that is totally an indication of the, the population of insects. 
um, that we don't have. Remember, people had those special covers to protect the front of their cars from from uh, you know insect bodies, and you know, so it wouldn't ruin their paint. And so that that alone is is an is a very concrete indicator of of a tremendous change that has that has evolved. In the, in the past 30 years, most of it probably due to climate change and also loss of habitat. So those are, those are two things that are, that are critical at this point in terms of how we deal with our, the world around us. Um, so the, for today, our, our theme is that you can create a landscape <clears throat> around, you know, in the, in the area of, of land that you are responsible for, whether it's your, whether it's your own yard, whether it's a, a community, you know, park, whether it's, you know, the yard outside your business, I mean, you know, some, some landscape outside your business, you can have a tremendous impact, even on a very small space, um, you know, that, that dealing sustainably with your landscape supports a tremendously complex and diverse wildlife community. And the more, the more diverse, the more biodiverse is the term, um, the better, essentially, the more, the, the healthier the system will be. If we can maintain lots of different organisms in those systems, we will have a healthier system. Um, you know, that we provide food and we're not just providing food, we need to provide housing, we need to, you know, we need to think about, we need to be aware of the interactions of the whole, you know, the whole system with each other. Also creating a healthy ecosystem in your landscape protects local watersheds because it, it helps decrease water runoff um, by allowing water to be absorbed into the system. Um, we filter the water before it reaches the water table. We, we help you know, prevent tremendous floods um, and things like that by, by, um, by slowing the water down essentially. That's, that's what we're trying to do in many cases. Um, also, a very an active, healthy ecosystem will um, pull carbon out of the atmosphere. The, carb, the atmosphere is our biggest carbon sink, it's referred to as. And if we th if we're thinking about climate change, carbon in the air is the is one of our biggest issues. Carbon in the ocean, we won't even go there today, but that's another problem. But carbon in the air, if you have a very healthy, active ecosystem in your landscape. That is that that is pulling carbon out of the air and creating carbon mole, carbon based molecules that can then that then will eventually we can we it gets stored into the soil. Complex science there, which we won't we won't hit this morning, but but uh, but trust me on that one. I don't know <clears throat> you, you haven't met me before, but but it's true. Um, so just some some organisms that many of us enjoy or love and and might motivate us. Um, <clears throat> Butterflies are, are, are particularly popular with, with uh, people interested in, in native gardening. Um, and they are very colorful. They're like the megafauna of our, of our gardening, you know, of our gardening work. These are, um, so on the, on the left, we've got a spice bush swallowtail. And on the right, we have another swallowtail called a giant swallowtail. And in between them is, is a much smaller um, little butterfly called an American copper. Um, so those are just some some lovely examples. This this um, spice the the giant swallowtail on the right, that's a that's a that's a a butterfly that has moved north. That is a southern butterfly that we now see in New England quite regularly. Um, but but you know even 15, 20 years ago it was it was unusual. Um, bees now bees are a huge issue. Some people are terrified of them. Some people conflate bees and wasps, but native bees are a very important resource in our ecosystems. And, and they are not dangerous. They, native bees are not aggressive um, in particular, unless you walk up and, and smack them. Um, they, you know, they tend to be very calm and go about their business and leave you, to, leave you be. So they're not, they're not a bee that, that we need to worry about and they, we want to encourage them. Um, down, uh, down in the lower left is um, a common Eastern bumblebee, very common. When you are outside and you see a fuzzy bee, you're most likely seeing a common Eastern bumblebee. There are, there are several different species. This is a different kind of bumblebee. Um, this is a, a Bombus perplexus, um, a confusing bumblebee. Um, and, um, and then we have two other native bees on the right 
top and bottom, you can see, I'm gonna turn on my laser pointer here. See if that helps helps you visualize what I'm what I'm talking about. You can see that this this bee has got tons of pollen on its hind leg. Um, this bee not so much. This is a different kind of a bee. But the, but there are hundreds of species of native bees that are very important pollinators and um, thus important to the to the success of of many different plants in our in our local systems. And dragonflies and damselflies another sort of megafauna of insects that most people love. Um, and you can encourage these um, in, your, in your local um, landscapes. They do need water for their, um, their nymphs, nymphal stages. They lay eggs and, and their, their, their youth stages, their teenage years, um, which are only months for them, but weeks are in water. You, this is actually an, um, one dragonfly eating another dragonfly. They are excellent predators. Um, and will consume things like mosquitoes and stuff like that. So they're, they're a beautiful, beautiful um, group of uh, insects that most people like. Now, for many of us, the big megafauna of our, of our local landscapes are birds. And birds need food. Um, birds need caterpillars. And by, by creating a sustainably um, aimed landscape of natural plants, we encourage caterpillars and birds need caterpillars. Um, so that's, that's, you know, that's our connection to birds in terms of our landscape, um, basically is shelter and caterpillars. <laughs> a lot of caterpillars, it takes a lot of, it, it takes some, um, well, we'll talk about that. So in terms of best practices, think of your landscape not as, oh, I like these flowers, I'm gonna put them here, or I like this color or whatever. Think of your landscape as habitat. You are providing food, you're providing shelter. Ideally, there's some water. I have a very small yard. I, I'm, I have, it's less than a quarter of an acre. It's a tiny little space in a, in a town with yards that are much bigger um, in general. And, and um, I, it's, it's, it's basically completely native. I have this tiny little area of lawn that I've lawn, you know, my husband mows it because um, he wanted some, he wanted some space without, you know, with, with grass. Um, but, uh, but in general, I have, I have native shrubs and, and trees and wildflowers, and I have just a tremendous array of birds and insects that, that utilize my yard. And I don't have water because right near me, I have water that um, I have a little brook that's no more than you know, 25 yards away. So I'm, I don't worry about supplying them with water. Um, and in general, you don't need to supply water unless you are truly in an area with none. So that's, that's something to think about. And we'll talk about water more at the end. Now, as I said, you need a variety of structure. You need different things. You need, you need some trees, some shrubs, ideally some trees, some shrubs, some, some vegetation, um, some perennial herbaceous stuff. And you can add annuals. But you, and annuals are important in the Northeast um, in, some, in some areas in particular where it's cold to get blooms early in the season. We don't have a lot of things that bloom really early. Um, so you might wanna throw in some annuals um, in your, in your um, landscape so that you have some nice blooms very early on. Predominantly, you know, 90% ideally plus native plants and minimal lawn. Those are best practices. That's, that's, sort, of the, that's sort of the goal. You don't have to get there at the first minute you start. And we'll talk more about that as we go on. So the thing about habitat, let me go back to that first one, is habitat, a good habitat supplies food, shelter, water, all the things that an organism needs to, to survive. It doesn't just give them nectar plants. It gives, you know, it gives them host plants for the caterpillars, for instance, when we're talking about butterflies. So that's, that's something that we will come back to. We will talk about the, the, the aspects of habitat and your yard. Um, so, Think of your yard as an ecosystem. Uh, you know, if you can do that, if you can focus on an ecosystem, what 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 are you providing? What is your does your ecosystem have all the elements of a healthy ecosystem? When you think about it, here we have a simple food web, and a food web is exactly what it sounds like. You know, the sunlight supplies the energy, and then we have the the producers, the plants down here at the bottom, represented by this sort of sunflower looking looking graphic, and that that plant then supplies food and energy to a numerous 
to a diverse group of organisms and then some of those you know eat those organisms and then then we have birds that eat those organisms and then we have even we even have some birds that eat birds or birds that eat mice or we're we're missing things that are pretty common in most of our mm -hmm. our yards or landscapes such as chipmunks and and um stuff like that um you know fox snake voles um amphibians you know a frog or a toad stuff like that they're not all here but but you get the picture is that this is all very very interconnected here we have a great picture of a of a um this is a some kind of a jumping spider a bull jumping spider probably um making a meal out of out of a fly it looks like it's probably a technid fly but and in a flower so that that spider was waiting in the flower for a for some organism that came to pollinate or nectar on the flower and then trapped it and there you go that's true flies are often excellent pollinators but another another topic um, there's so many topics here and it's going to be hard to to keep us moving in a in, in a linear fashion but i will i will try to stick with it um, i'm just checking my time <clears throat> okay now so food we talked about and we'll talk more about food in a minute but structure think about what kind of what kind of layers are in the habitat edge is for most of us because we live in an area where where we do have some open space and we need to have some lawn area um, that think about the what the edge of that lawn area is like think about the trees or the the vegetation underneath the trees or the shrubby layer um, you need to have all those layers and what you know all of those different structures you can have coniferous or evergreen um, plants in here you can have deciduous plants in here and and what works best in your area and what what you enjoy you know don't don't dismiss what you like as well as what's good for the you know what's good for the ecosystem because you can you can hit both you can hit both um, if once you once you start looking and working on this um, this is a fairly um, young landscape we don't have a lot of big mature trees there's some back here but but you know, it's all a work. Nature is a work in progress, right? We're all a work in progress. Um, here's a different type of structure, a more meadowy structure. Um, if you want open space, but you don't actually need the lawn, then aiming for for meadow um, habitat is is a terrific thing to do. We don't we don't have a lot of good meadows um, in in most of our areas because we have trees and we have lawns. Um, for the most part, that's that landscapers tend to focus on the big trees and maybe some shrubs and then the, you know, the mode areas for for human use. Um, so if you have a space that can be that can be converted from lawn to meadow, that'd be great. Then, you know, some some shrubs around the edges um, are always good, both for shelter and for for um, sitting spaces for the birds that will come to, you know, eat the eat the insects that are here in this in this nice um, blooming meadow. Um, think about flowers. <clears throat> think about the shape and the use and the timing of your flowers. Um, I know it, it, it seems a little complicated, but but there are, there are different different shapes of flowers uh, are used utilized by different types of organisms. Here is here is um, this is a skipper of some kind um, and with its proboscis in a um, milkweed flower, right? So it's not just monarchs, right? Milkweeds are good for milkweeds are good because they of the way they bloom. Lots of lots of blooms that that repeat that that keep opening sequentially. Sorry. Um, and then here's a hummingbird on a on a on a hyssop, which is a long, deep, tiny little flower, and the hummingbird tongues are perfect for that. Um, so this is a plant that, that appeals to hummingbirds and other long-tongued organisms. There are some long-tongued bees and butterflies, things like that. And again, because you have sequential blooming of all these tiny little blossoms that, that bloom, um, it offers them many opportunities for nectaring. Um, basically, remember that nectar is the bribe. The flower creates nectar as a bribe for the pollinator. The flower is not utilizing that nectar. The, the, the nectar is produced so that the, 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 in the organism, the fly, the bee, the butterfly, the 
bird, whatever it is, that's coming to drink that nectar actually picks up some pollen and delivers it to the next flower that it, you know, like this hummingbird will move to another hyssop or even move to a different flower on this hyssop. And it will, it will carry pollen from one flower to another. And so that what the, what, the, what the flower is trying to do is get that pollinator to carry pollen and they offer the nectar as a, as a food source, as, a, as an energy source, as a whatever. Um, and so it's a bribe. Um, what, what the flower is really interested in is getting the pollen moved from flower to flower, from plant to plant. Okay, and then um, here's, here's different, different types of flowers. Here's a, here's a flower that, that you have to be sort of a big, big sturdy creature in order to get into this flower. So they're, they're you know, it, it's, it's perfect for a lot of our native bees, some of our bigger native bees. This is a, this is a native bee that, that the pollen carrying um, capacity is on the base of the, on the base of the abdomen. So that's kind of cool. These are, this is a leaf cutter bee. Um, but so a lot of our native bees, you know, they can, they can push their way in the, the bumblebees and stuff like that. Um, and they can, they can get in there and, 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 and collect, collect the pollen and, and, and retrieve the nectar. Other, these, these big flat ray flowers, you know, all of those flowers that bloom like this, the flowers are actually millions of tiny little flowers in the middle of, of the rays and they bloom sequentially again. So they offer lots of opportunity for the, for the insects. They offer a good landing pad for the insects. So they're easy to access. So you have all different kinds of flower structure. There are a million different kinds of floral structures. And just think about, think about offering a variety of floral structure both through, um, you know, through different types of plants and different types, different times of blooming. So the, the, I mean, in my mind, the two most successful flower shapes are the two most, the, you know, the kind of the ones to focus on are those that, that lots of tiny flowers, either in a, you know, on a raceme like this, on a tall stem or on a ray like this, but those that, that produce lots of tiny little flowers that will bloom sequentially are, are, um, are really good generalist flowers to, to, to think about. Um, and you want to think about seasonality. Um, flowers are, you know, flowers are important throughout the season, but all there are different kinds of food that are important throughout the season. On the left here, we have an oriole in probably, uh, probably it's a crab apple, which is not a native plant, but you know, you can't have everything. Um, so this is this, but this oriole may in fact be collecting insects. Um, orioles do like nectar. Um, but they also, they collect insects to feed their, their, off, their, their hatchlings. All birds around here, all of the songbirds that, that, that live in, you know, that, that we see in the spring, they're, they're collecting insects. Insects are a really good food source to, to feed your, your babies. You've got lots of good protein in there. Um, and, and so it's, it's, it's good stuff to grow on and you need insects, you need those caterpillars. Um, so it's entirely feasible that that this this oriole is is um, is collecting caterpillars out of there, um, but but this is a plant that blooms early, so it's good for early pollinators. It's good for the early season pollinators. Um, we have a a bee balm in the on the right hand side. You know that's a that's a summer blooming plant. I, I noticed the other day my bee balm is opened and it will bloom now from. It will bloom from now through through a good part of the summer. It will repeatedly bloom, um, and so that that's a good summer blooming, you know, food source. Um, and it will bring hummingbirds. If you plant bee balm, you will get hummingbirds. I guarantee. Um, this is a female ruby throated hummingbird. For those of us in the Northeast, this is the uh, this is. 99% of the time, this is the only hummingbird you will see is a ruby-throated hummingbird. And this is a female because it has no ruby throat. <clears throat> now, in the left here, um, I found this picture in our, in, our, in our image library. And this to me is just, you know, this is like, this, 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 this sort of describes the ecosystem in miniature, this one picture right here. This is fall, the leaves are turning. Um, we've got fruit on, on We've got lots of fruit. You can see here's an Eastern bluebird that's, that's consuming one of the berries. Um, you can see that there's damage to the leaves. Notice the coloration is, is, 
is interrupted. I'm sorry, it's it's not very in focus, but you can see, and that damage indicates that this has been a food source for many insects throughout the season. Hasn't harmed the plant, but but we've got lots of different caterpillars that have been able to utilize this particular plant um, as a food source. And those caterpillars then are food source for somebody else. And also up here in the very top left, you see that pointed little thing sticking out the end of the stem. That is next year's flower bud. So here we are, this is probably September, maybe early October in the life of this. This is a flowering dogwood, a native flowering dogwood, um, <clears throat> Cornus Florida. And, and you can't, you, in my mind, you couldn't pick a better small tree to put, to put in your landscape. Um, I'd be hard pressed to come up with one that, that, that I think is better. The, the, the fruit, is very nutritious for, for these birds that, that consume it. And, and the flowers will open in the spring and, and be utilized by, by spring pollinators. Um, the leaves are, support many different kinds of, of, uh, of insects. So, you know, here, here is, you know, ecosystem in miniature right here in this one plant. I love this. Um, <clears throat> And we'll talk, we'll actually touch on this later when we, we're talking more about native plants in, in a couple slides. Um, this is winter and, and we have lots of, of, of songbirds that overwinter with us. And so trees offer them good shelter. Um, these are, these are, this is a birch. So these are next season's catkins and they can, they can probably, they can find some food in there. Um, <clears throat> this is a winter goldfinch, so it's not yellow. Um, but so think of seasonality, think of supplying both shelter and food throughout the seasons um, as, as well as you can. Um, again, going back to the best, best, best practices, in terms of winter, the best thing you can do in the winter is do not clean the yard. Leave the, leave the stems, leave the seed heads on the stems, all of the leave the leaves on the ground. All of these things supply food um, and shelter. The sh um, many of our overwintering insects overwinter as a, a pupa. They don't overwinter. Um, not you know some pupal stage cocoon chrysalis. Think that think that concept. And they they do so inside of a inside of a stem, inside of the you know under the leaf litter. All of these things. And so. For our, for our insects, most of which we want to encourage, the vast majority of insects are beneficial insects or useful insects um, in the ecosystem. They are not pathogens um, or pathogenic. Um, so we want to encourage our insects and, and, to, and the best thing you can do to encourage your insects is to give them places to overwinter. Overwinter is, is the you know, sort of our defining season, right? You have to get through winter to take advantage of what we have right now but it's getting through winter that's the hard part. And you can see that all of this disruption in the snow, there's been, there's been lots of, of birds coming to, to feed on the seed, the seed heads of this, of this um, probably a rue, I think this is, um, you know, just the seed heads that were left there. So, so resist, the, resist cleaning your yard. If you're one of those people who wants to clean the yard, that, then, then uh, restrain yourself. I work with a woman who is in charge of some of our beds up, up by the, uh, by our admissions area, and she constantly wants to clean them, and I have to, uh, I have to, you know, rein her in um, because it's just there's it, this is ve very important winter. Um, this is a white-throated sparrow, um, you know, scavenging through the through the leaf litter. Um, so there you go. Best practice: you you need the remember the remember the pollination you know nectar thing and and think think about that in terms of what you choose to put out for flowers showy flowers that do not supply pollen or nectar are actually you know they're 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 of no functionality in an ecosystem so this is this is a, an echinacea um sorry just blanked on the a cone flower. This is a cone flower as it normally would exist in the wild. And this is a cultivar of a cone, of a cone flower. Now, not all cultivars are, are, are bad, um, but this cultivar, it, it has been, you know, it been mod the modification is such that it produces, it has no anthers. 
Um, it probably has no pistils. It, ha it, does, it does not have any male or female flower parts, thus it's producing no pollen and no nectar. And so while it may be fun to look at, it, has, it, has, it is not a resource. It is not a functional part of our ecosystem. Um, so, and so um, a lot of times cultivars emphasize that showiness that, you know, oh, look at this flower because, you know, we tend to just look at it for, for color and, and excitement. But, but, but look at, look at be, be more critical in terms of, of what that flower is supplying for our, our, um, our local wildlife when you're looking at it. Um, let me just, just checking my time. We're doing well. Okay, the other thing that is very hard for some people is, is the leaf, is, is leaf litter. Leaf litter is one of the best things we can have. It is a totally natural resource in, when you live in a, you know, a biome like ours. We, you know, we live in the, the deciduous forest biome, you know, the eastern deciduous forest. So we have lots and lots of leaves. Use, utilize them. Let them. Just let them fall and stay under your shrubbery. You can even leave them on your lawn if you can bring yourself to it. Most people can't, but, but there's no reason to remove the leaves. Um, and as I said, there are lots of things that overwinter in that leaf litter. Um, bumblebees in particular, bumblebees are something that people tend to, tend to be drawn towards and, and, and they need that, you know, all of our native, a lot of our native bees, not all of them, but they need that leaf litter in order to, 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 um, to get through the winter. Plus they are natural weed suppressants and, and as they decompose, they fertilize the ground. I can't stress this enough that, that keeping, I've even seen now some, some little um, campaign slogan things called leave the leaves. So that's, that's our campaign slogan for the day. Um, if nothing else is leave the leaves. I admit that I have a son-in-law who has a, a, a yard that is pristine. I cannot get him to, to let the leaves lie. He, he, he rakes out the leaves and, and puts them in the, uh, you know, they go, to the, they go to the compost at the dump and then he puts on bark mulch. He puts on dyed bark mulch. I admit it's like it's like painful to me, but um, but I I, I can't get him to stop, and I'm I'm not I, because he says it looks messy. So that's that's what most of us have been working with for for many years is that it looks messy, um, and I you know my yard definitely compared to many of my neighbors is messy, but I've also influenced two neighbors near me to stop using bark mulch. I feel like I'm I'm compensating for my son-in-law. But I've got two, two, two neighbors interested in, in creating better, better habitat and, and, and yards, and they, they no longer use bark mulch. So I feel like I've made some progress. It's an ongoing battle. Um, so, um, and, and in terms of to continue that, that conversation of how we include or how we, how we improve our habitats is use of native plants. Native plants are those plants that are normally found in this space that we live in, whatever, whatever your space is. You know, if you're in New England, then our vast array of native plants are pretty similar. Sorry, that's my phone dinging. I've got to turn that off. Um, so, so, you know, you will support a vastly greater amount of animal diversity. Native plants are what most of, of our butterflies need a native plant, not to nectar in necessarily. You may see a, a butterfly come and, and, and collect nectar off a totally introduced flower, but it needs native plants to lay its eggs on and to feed its larvae, Mo the caterpillars. Most caterpillars require native plants to, to, turn, you know, to, to live their juvenile stages in order to become an adult. Um, so, so you will you will supply you will you will influence your ecosystem tremendously by 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 uh, the use of native um, flowering plants um, rather than introduced flowering plants. I can't you know, and it doesn't need to be directly. I mean, there's some people who say if it didn't if it wasn't in in North New England you know 500 years ago then you can't plant it here. And that I don't I don't go with that. Um, there are lots of plants from the mid-Atlantic that do very well here. And as, as our climate shifts and we get warmer, certainly, um, and, and they still support most of our native wildlife. Um, so, but, but just think about, and, and once you get them established, native plants take care of themselves. I do very little work in my, in my yard and I have a, 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 you know, 
a constant array of flowering um, perennials and flowering shrubs and fruit and all kinds of things going on here that, that I don't have to fuss with. Um, there's very little fussing once you get a good native, um, native garden established. So um, and here we have, this is an Asclepius tuberosa, a butterfly weed, not a butterfly bush. That is an introduced plant that we do not recommend at all because it will escape. Um, and it's a nuisance plant when it escapes. So butterfly weed though is a native plant and it's very, it grows very easily. Um, and, and it's a very supportive. Here we have, a, we have this, we have several different native bees on here, the out of focus in the back and this lovely coral pear streak in focus in the front. So there you go, um, native plants. You know, it, as I said, you've got to have the caterpillars. The caterpillars have to have those native leaves um, and, and without, the, without, the, without the caterpillars eating the native leaf, here's, a, here's a, an inchworm um, on, a, on an oak leaf. And you know, here's, a, here's a chickadee looking for its, for its next meal. Um, and you can see that there are lots of insects have been eating these leaves and, and using these leaves. And these plants, the plants evolved with, the, with these insects. Native plants evolved with our native insects. And so they, they're not, they're not in, in um, opposition all the time. They often work together. They encourage each other because they, they are beneficial to each other or they're, they're at least not pathogenic. But so don't worry so much if you, don't worry if you see some native damage on, a, on an otherwise healthy looking um, plant. So I just, I love this picture. So this is a, this is a barn swallow um, and, um, you know, feeding, feeding its, feeding its young. Uh, I believe that's a dragonfly that is springing in. Um, so we need insects in order to, to have birds, we need insects and, and all these birds require lots of insects. Um, somebody, I, I don't know who studied this, but, but the, the estimate is that a chickadee, a, a pair of chickadees need 6,000 caterpillars to raise, you know, um, to raise a nest of hatchlings until they fledge. Um, here's another statistic, 300 caterpillars a day brought by Eastern bluebirds. So if you don't have any bugs, you don't have any birds. You can't, you, you won't have those, those baby birds supported. These two here are, this is a pair of wood thrushes in there waiting patiently for the parent to come back um, with, with some food. Um, the, these, these are, they, these are the groups, oaks in particular, the, the cherries, the wild, you know, like black cherries or, or, um, or, uh, oh, sorry, I just, pin cherries. Um, there's many different kinds of, there's several different kinds of cherries and, and lots of different kinds of birches, um, and willows. These are, these are, these are woody plants, woody trees and, um, and shrubs that support a lot of, of, um, caterpillar diversity. Um, although dogwoods, I would throw in there too. Now that I, I not, didn't put it in, but there you go. Um, now here, we're back. This is back to our, our dogwood conversation of, of the, the picture that I had of the bluebird eating the, eating the berry. This is, a, this is our native flowering dogwood on the right. And this is an introduced kusa dogwood on the left. The kusa comes from Asia. And it, 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 was, it was promoted um, starting back, I, I mean, it's been around for a while, but I think starting back in the 80s and the 90s, maybe it was promoted as the tree. You didn't want to have, don't, don't plant flowering dogwoods because they might get a disease called anthracnose and they, they'll die. Plant these kusa dogwoods because they'll, they'll bloom, they'll be beautiful, the blooms last forever, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, now the thing is that how many caterpillars are supported by an introduced kusa dogwood? And given my my harangue for the morning, I bet you can guess it. Zero. Zero species of, 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 cat, of native caterpillars are, can, can use the kusa dogwood as a host plant. For, our, for the flowering dogwood, it's 117. So just by that one choice of using a flower, of planting a flowering dogwood, a kusa florida rather than a, I mean, a, a cornus florida rather than a cornus kusa, um, you've, you've, you've made a huge impact on your local ecosystem. So 117 species of caterpillars during, during the, the summer. <coughs> and then when we look at the fruit, here's the kusa fruit, which looks like a giant 
pudgy raspberry kind of thing. Actually tastes like a mango. You can eat it because it is a fruit designed to attract monkeys in its native habitat or its native ecosystems. Kusas utilize monkeys are the seed vector for Kusa dogwood. So this is a fruit that is aimed at attracting primates. And so it actually tastes good to us. However, as opposed to the flowering dogwood, our, our native flowering dogwood, which produces a berry that is very nutritious and attractive to birds and comes out in like September and October when their food resources are diminishing and they might need some food, some good food resources before they migrate. Um, so the whole thing is, is based around, you know, how that tree, it relates to, to everything else, right? Um, so that's just a really clear cut example of, of a, of a easy choice to make. Um, and, and one that has significant repercussions in, in the effectiveness of your habitat. Here's another one, Bradford pear, luckily has become a, a tree that is not utilized as much, but it was highly utilized for a long time and, and still very po still popular. I mean, you'll still see a lot of it. it. It blooms and it's gorgeous when it blooms. And other than that, it has absolutely, it has very little habitat impact. It's not a resource. If you look at the leaves of a Bradford pear, there's nothing, nothing eats that Bradford pear. Here on the right, we have our sugar, our native sugar maple. And by the end of the season, the leaves are, have been eaten and chewed and, and utilized. And, and this, native, this native sugar maple will support all kinds of insects um, and supply all kinds of, of habitat resources that the Bradford pear just can't even come close to. Okay. Um, I can't give you a, I can't give you a, a, a good list. Here's a, here's a, here's just, you know, for two seconds. Um, uh, Robert, I know will send, send out the, the link so that you can come back and look at the resource list, which will be at the end. And I recommend that if you really want to, if you really want to um, look at, at the, you know, uh, to set up a good set of plants for you to utilize. Um, but, but we have lots of flowering, fruiting um, shrubs. Nine bark is, is, is good. However, there are uh, mostly you will find cultivars of nine bark, which I do not recommend. Um, the cultivars were are long, long story. We won't go into it, but the cultivars are not locally produced cultivars and thus are really not functional as a, as a habitat resource. So only if you can find straight species nine bark would I recommend nine bark. Um, and the cornus, the local cornus, both cornus Florida and cornus, which are have a different, um, they're in different genera now, but we still refer to them all as cornice, all our shrubs, all our, all our dogwood shrubs, as well as our dogwood tree. And viburnums are another one, although they have their issues now um, with some introduced pests. Native grasses, native sedges, um, native violets, there are lots of native violets. Um, and then, you know, just the variety of, of, flowering, of flowering perennials that, that will take you from early spring all the way to the very, to the, to the last of the hard frosts. Um, this, is in, this is in chronological order, spring to, spring to late. So, but again, we won't, we won't dwell on that right now. Just some, some images of some of these, um, you know, in terms of the variety of flowers and colors and blooms that you will get. Um, they're just, I mean, this isn't a great showy flower, but it's beautiful. Spotted bee balm is beautiful. So, you know, you just have to appreciate life in a different, in a different realm. Um, bird feeders and bee feeders, we like, to, we like to call, some of these plants are really good um, in terms of, like this is, a, this is a blueberry. This is probably a high bush blueberry, I would say. And, and the, the flowers are really good for the bees. They are really good pollinator plants um, in terms of feeding the pollinators and then you know, as at once they get pollinated, they produce a berry that is that is a, a, a great food resource. If you're lucky, you can get a few off of them. Um, I never do. I have several high bush blueberries um, in my yard, and I that just when I think that they're ripe enough to to pick, maybe in a day or two, the 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 birds take them all. They're gone. Um, you know, so I I feel like they need them more than I do. Um, and and I'm happy to I'm happy to supply that resource. Um, but just think of think of utilization by multiple types of wildlife. 
when you start looking at, especially at your shrub and tree layers. Um, so again, back to our list. This is the list we had a few slides back because now we're gonna talk about the lawn part on, on this list, the minimal lawn part. And this is often the hardest bit for people because we are so used to lawns. Lawns were invented as a means of, of showing that how, how much space you had that you didn't have to utilize it for a practical purpose. You didn't have to plow it up and plant vegetables. You didn't have to have it as an orchard. You had so much property, that it's true, that it's a landscape, it's a landscape invention a lawn, you had so much property that you could afford to just have it be a lawn. Um, and so it comes out of a out of a landscape tradition that comes to us from, from England um, in towards the, the late 1800s. Um, and, and basically it was it was just a means of, of uh, displaying your wealth. And so it is not when we're considering green in terms of the ecological impact, lawns are definitely not green. Um, and and um, the same son-in-law with the bark mulch, you know, he is constantly putting herbicides and fertilizers on his lawn, and he doesn't. He, I, I kept telling him that clover growing up through the through the through the grass is is great. You know, if you let the clover, the little white clover grow, and you you will supply some food value with that for pollinators. Nope, can't. No, nope, no. Nope. He doesn't want any of it. He wants he wants that that perfect sort of turf grass look. But because they are poorly adapted for virtually all climates, um, except where those grasses come from, that they require constant support. Um, fertilizing, which is which is a really you know um, added you know um, commercial fertilizers are are not um, environmentally supportable in many ways. Um, and the, certainly the herbicides and pesticides that most people put on their lawns, you know, to kill the crabgrass or whatever. Those are, you know, I, whenever you're putting anything on to kill something, you, you need to be really cautious and, and judicious in the use of it and what you're doing. Um, and they often require extra water. Um, you know, even in, a, even in a climate like ours, where we get, you know, we, we are used to a certain amount of water, um, we still, you know, people still have to irrigate their lawns, they water them. Um, you know, this is, this is typical lawn come and using a yard, you know, using a landscaping company to, to mow the lawn, they often recommend and utilize a lot of synthetic herbicides and pesticides that are definitely not beneficial to our, to our ecosystems. Um, so what can you do? Most people, you know, I'm not saying you have to get rid of your lawn. You know, we're, we're, we're nowhere, we don't recommend that. We don't recommend making people miserable, but, but mow your lawn slightly higher rather than a really low lawn, mow it a little longer, mow it taller. The taller the, 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 taller the grass, it, the, the, the greater the height you keep the grass at, the better the root system will develop. Um, and, and if you use a mulching lawnmower and you return some that, you return those little grass clippings into the lawn, um, it will be good for the grass. It will be good for the soil. Um, go through an aerate um, and use different grass mixes. There are now lots of mixes. They're not native plants, most of them, but they are still, they are grass mixes that have been introduced specifically for their tolerance to, to not needing herbicides and not needing um, irrigation. And they will grow slowly enough that they don't, that they can grow up and don't need to be mowed constantly. Um, there are a number of good grass mixes out there if you want to if you want to try to to you know re reconfigure your lawn. I highly recommend it. What you can do instead of of you know the the classic um, bluegrass and stuff like that. But the other thing to consider is is where are there areas that you don't need there to be lawn. You know where you know rather than mowing the whole space. What can you do? You know, where can where can you get away with with you know letting some of this grow up and be a meadow? So where where will you not miss it? And and what what can you use for other ground covers if there are places where you still want it to be low? And um, and then you know where are the places that you really need the lawn where you're gonna you know you're gonna play your your ball games or or put out your your lawn chair? Um, and how can you treat that area in a way that that's more sustainable? Um, and so that's that's the that's the lawn issue is is just to think about in integrating the lawn into the into the concept of of uh, of of native habitat 
ecosystems. Um, it's not, I, I wouldn't, if you're, if you're just starting, I don't recommend starting with thinking, oh, I got to get rid of my lawn because that is a, that's a heavy task. I recommend starting with, you know, we'll, and we'll talk about that in a minute, um, you know, starting differently, but, but there are native ground covers that you can put down that require far less maintenance and that you can walk on them. Um, you can mow them um, intermittently, you know, two or three times in a season, you, they don't need a lot of mowing, um, but they will, they will cover the ground with a green ground cover and they will still support native wildlife. Um, this is a Pennsylvania sedge, which actually fills in very nicely. It, it grows no more than six to eight inches tall in general. Sometimes it'll get taller than that, but it's a, it, you know, it is, it's a, it's a tremendous um, host plant. Violets are, are a ter terrific host plant. Um, for, for a lot of different butterflies. And so all of these, all of these sort of low impact design um, you know, elements are, are things to consider as you, as you work your way into you know, sort of um, lawn, you know, gardening, gardening as to support wildlife. Um, now, water. Oh, I'm running out of time. So we'll, we'll run through water. Water and rain gardens, something to consider. Where can you slow down the water? Where can you capture the water? How do you, how do you build a rain garden? All of those things. Um, that's an important aspect. Now here, here is a, an image of, this is outside of, of one of our sanctuaries in Worcester. And here's what it looks like now. And here's what it looked like before. There was just this, it would, it would you know, it was, it was a swale that was meant to just capture water and not let it flow into the road as much. But you can see that that by with with the native plantings, it has become a, a, a totally useful um, water garden, rain garden, um, which is you know just leads us into you know everything is a resource. It's not you don't have to remove stuff. Don't take away the things you clip. Use them. Let some parts of your your yard be messy. Um, have the neat parts where you need them and have the messy parts where you know where you can where you can utilize them. Um, and this is the most important thing. It needs to be sustainable for you to do, right? It needs to be, don't try to take on the whole task at once. Take on bits, take on parts, take on, you know, putting in some native perennials. Whatever, whatever you works for you as a focus that will that will help you be engaged and will will allow you to to engage in the process and be doable for you. Um, but aim for aim for this. You know, this is native perennials are a pretty pretty low bar to to step into. Um, and having so, so having some native perennial areas in in a, in a landscape that that's a great place to start. Um, you know, this is an issue in that many, many of the plants that are available in commercial nurseries, especially places like, you know, Home Depot and stuff like that, have already been treated, particularly with neonicotinoids, which are really bad things and we don't want them. Um, so, so try to make sure that when you are buying even a native plant, that it has not already been treated with some sort of pesticide. Leave the leaves um, and advocate for insects, you know. Our, mass, our advocacy department is always telling us that we need to tell people to, to join the joint, you know, make their voices heard. Um, we do not need to spray in Massachusetts. We spray indiscriminately for, for triple E. And in most communities, it's just not, it, it's not functional. There has been, there's no data to support that, that spraying for mosquitoes actually um, has an impact on the number of cases of triple E. So there you go. But, um, and then Two books by Doug Tallamy, who is a who is um, I believe he's retired now, but he was at the University of Delaware, and these are great books. If you want, if you want to read about some, if you want to read to be inspired, I recommend Doug's books. They're great. Um, they're very very accessible. But how you can can support wildlife, that's what these both of these books are all about. And then here's a resource list, um, which which Robert you can when you get the link. Tomorrow, you know, you'll have time to, to pull, you know, to have this slide up for you and, and you can actually utilize these resources. This one at the bottom just came to me this morning, actually, from a colleague. This is the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources. And there is a list in there I haven't even, I didn't go through. I just wanted to put this up here. So you guys, there's a very long list of, of, 
of resources. And so I haven't vetted any of them, but I, I presume the Department of Agriculture did. Um, so hopefully, uh, but, but it just looked like a really impressive list. So there we go. That, that's our last slide for the day. Um, I'm going to stop my screen share. I'm going to stop my, there we All go. All right, Tia. So Tia, we have 20, and my phone rings the minute I unmute. So Tia, we have 20 questions for you. And okay. folks, I, I, so we're going we're gonna to consolidate questions. And uh, if you have any additional questions, you want to get them into the Q&A now. And uh, we're going to do our best. Tia, um, what do you think? 10 minutes of questions? Does that work I'm, for you? I'm happy. I'm happy if people are willing to stay a few minutes longer. I can do, I can do 10, 15 minutes. Okay. Easily. Excellent. And we are recording if anyone needs to drop off early. But I will try to address as many questions as we can in 15 minutes. Uh, Catherine and, and Tia, I, I know you gave me permission to stop you, uh, but I, I did not want to ask any questions. We, we just kept the flow going and you were able to finish in an hour. So that worked out well. So Catherine asks, I leave my leaves down on my perennial gardens in the fall. In the spring, I rake and use an electric shredder to shred the leaves and respread them as mulch. I always wonder when in the spring is the best time to rake and shred. What is the earliest I can do it without disturbing the bugs? Excellent question, Catherine. And 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 um, so the first thing I would say is you don't need to to collect them and shred them. They will decompose on their own. They will not inhibit your perennials. You may have you may find that some have to you know need a little encouragement to grow up through them. But I I highly recommend not taking them in and shredding them and putting them back just let them go. Save yourself the effort. But in terms of the timing question of like when people want to cut down the dead stems from last year um, and, you know, pick up stuff like that, I would say you want to wait until the days are red, are usually 50 degrees. So for most of, you know, depending on where you are, north to south, it's, it's sometime in April. Um, but you want consistent, by the time the days are 50, consistently 50 degrees, most of your insects will have emerged. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, what about carpenter bees? Should we exterminate them if they have burrowed nests in our homes? Uh, mm -hmm. Follow-up question, how do we get rid of carpenter bees so they don't do damage to the house without an exterminator so they can keep pollinating? There you go. Okay, carpenter bees are always an issue. And the thing, about, the thing to remember about carpenter bees is they do not burrow into the grain of the wood, they burrow into the end grain only. So what they are using mostly are, are exposed rafter tails and you need to keep them painted. If you keep a layer of paint or, or um, you know, what's, what's, sorry, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, some kind of product that protects your wood. I'm sorry, I just lost the vocabulary there. But if you keep your wood, the end grain of your wood protected, they cannot get into your, they, they will not go through that. So you just need a good, good layer of, of paint or, or stain or whatever is on your house over the end grain um, of your wood. And, and so- Varnish, uh, is that- Varnish, varnish would work if, you're, if, you're, if you've got a varnish on your house, stain, whatever it is that, that protects the wood of your house, just make sure your end grain is, is covered. Um, and, and they won't, because that's, that's how they get in, is they, they find exposed wood, they need exposed wood, they won't go through the paint or the varnish or whatever. Uh, Tia, I should come clean and tell you I know nothing about gardening, and I'm going to definitely mispronounce some words in some of these okay. questions here. Uh, so next up is Sally. She says, our yard gets almost no sun, so we don't have too many flowers. Uh, mostly uh, hoistas, I might be mispronouncing that, uh, ground cover, trees, stuff like that. Uh, a few hanging flowers. Is there anything we can do to encourage birds? We put a hummingbird feeder out a few years back and got no activity. Right. You probably you probably don't have enough. I mean, if you don't, if if all you can grow are hostas, then I encourage you to go to the resource list and look specifically for shade growing natives. Because hostas, you know, hostas are are again not supplying any any functionality to an ecosystem. Um, and again, if you don't have the the hummingbirds need to have other resources around them. They need to have other flowers. So, you know, if you've got any sunny edges or even partly sunny, partly, you know, part sun, part shade, you can get some good flowering, um, fruiting um, shrubs and, and other plants. But, but I encourage you go to those resource lists and, and focus on the, on the shady, the shady resources, because they're out there. 
an anonymous attendee asks, is there a good way to manage ticks naturally? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, ticks, ticks are what they are. Um, if, you if you are in an area that has a lot of ticks, one thing I know that some people do when they have, um, when they abut a, a wooded area that has a lot of deer or field mice, deer mice and field mice are probably the, the, a bigger issue than, the, than deer themselves. Um, but they, they put in a strip, they, they, they leave a bare strip, they, they, they take it down to the ground, nothing growing there and, and put on, you know, like a layer of, of wood chips um, just to separate their yard from the wooded area that in which the ticks are probably, but that's, that's a specific circumstance. But if you are finding ticks in your yard, then you probably knew, do need to consider keeping things lower, keeping your grasses lower. Um, and no, there's really, I don't know of any effective natural tick controls, unfortunately. Uh, climate change is another huge issue for ticks. That's why they're- um, an, an anonymous attendee asks, for various reasons, we haven't cleaned up our yard or removed any leaves for the last couple of years. When I raked up a bunch recently, there was no grass or anything beneath the leaves, just dirt. Is that normal? It, it is if, if what you had below it was, was a, a, a non-native turf grass. If you, you know, um, so actually you, you've, you've taken out, you've taken out what, what is, you've done the, what is one of the hardest steps for many people, which is to clear the area, you know. But my guess is if you remove those, those leaves and, and just leave that, that ground exposed, things will start to grow. Whether they're things you want or not, that's a different question. But, um, but yeah, lawns, turf grass lawns do not grow through leaf cover, but native ground covers can grow through leaf cover. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, I have a lot of oriental bittersweet growing <laughs> in a part of my yard. What can I plant that will fight its spread and thrive? Okay, so nothing will fight oriental bittersweet. I, I will say that right off the bat, but the, the things that you can plant in there that would grow sort of with the oriental bittersweet and then you try to control the, if you tr you control the oriental bittersweet just keep cutting it if nothing else you can dig it out but if you keep cutting it but if you plant things like virginia creeper um, which is an our, our local native vine um, you know other good ground covers you can you can inhibit it from coming back but I, there's nothing that will that will it's just so aggressive nothing nothing native can compete particularly uh, Jamie asks, I read somewhere that a 100% clover lawn is not recommended. I see, what, I see what you recommended is a mix of grass and clover. Can you explain more about why 100% clover is not ideal? That, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a, a lawn specialist question, which I don't really know the answer to. My, my inclination is that it's because of the life cycle of the clover that when the clover dies back, that you want other things growing there. You want to keep the ground covered to discourage weeds and, and other things that, that you don't want growing there. So that's what I presume is that you, you mix the clover into other plants. The clover is actually fertilizing because it, it, it you know, um, keeps nitrogen. Um, you know what I'm trying to say if you if you're with me on that one, but 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 so yes, I agree that probably 100% clover because it, it will die away and and leave you with exposed ground, um, and then you'll just get weeds. So Jeanette asks, do you have a list of native plants, and would that be something that we'd want to consult those sources on that uh, last slide of yours, or uh, where would you suggest folks get a list of native plants? So that's that's exactly what I suggest um, is is to go to the resources on that last slide in terms of, of finding good good uh, native plant lists and if you if you're looking for if you're in New England and you're looking for for resources for native perennials um, in particular the flowering perennials then the one I realized that's not on that list is Native Plant Trust Native mm -hmm. Plant Trust is is um, is our our local um, sort of and there, there are a number of nurseries around that now are much more, that are completely focused on native plants. Um, and I don't have a list of those, but, but uh, yeah, go to that resource list. Uh, Ruth asked, and you might've touched on this at the very end. Uh, Ruth asks, is there a problem with using 
uh, bark mulch. So is there a problem with using bark mulch? So there, there are a few things with bark mulch. One is that um, it, it doesn't supply uh, the, the it, it, it inhibits habitat, it inhibits the ground habitat, it inhibits all those organisms that need to be protected at ground level. Um, it off, uh, if you're buying bark mulch, you can be introducing uh, things that you wouldn't be in your yard. Um, it will often introduce a lot of, a lot of uh, fungi, not that that's generally problematic, but because of the way bark mulch decomposes, it's so dense and solid that it doesn't supply those air spaces, those living spaces that are necessary for the organisms that live in that leaf litter, in that top uh, layer of soil. Mm -hmm. uh, an anonymous attendee asks, what is the species name of the native flowering dogwood? Do you know it's that called, one? It's, it's easy. It's the state of Florida. It's Cornus, Florida. I don't know why it's called Cornus, Florida. I can't remember the origin of the word Florida, but that's it. Our native flowering dogwood tree is Cornus, Florida. All right, here's where I'm going to embarrass myself even more. So we're going to talk uh, about some specific uh, species here. And Paula wants to know, is um, Heliniathus, H-E-L-I-A-N-T-H-I-S, is that good for the natural, la is that good for the natural landscape? Helianthus are, are fine. There's a, there's a whole group of plants, the Helianthus, the Heliopsis, um, and there are definitely native species in those genera. And they are, they are, you know, they, they're, they're sort of those, those native, um, they're the perennial sunflower group is what they're called. And yeah, they're fine. They're good. Uh, Martha asks about uh, peonies. Um, they're showy, but are they a good choice? No, peonies are, are beautiful. Peonies are, they, they, they are not native and they really don't supply um, they don't have, they don't supply any, any resources. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having a few peonies in your yard. You know, I have, the, I actually have some peonies in my yard that somebody gave me decades ago. Um, and, and they're very pretty. And uh, pa Paula is wondering about sheep sorrel, S-O-R-R-E-L. Is, is that a good choice? There's not, yeah, sheep sorrel is fine. There's nothing wrong with sheep sorrel. There's sheep there's, there's like a sheep laurel also, which is a shrub. That's a different, that's a different plant, but the, and sheep laurel is fine too. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, if you have a totally wild yard, um, where should uh, one start uh, to keep it native, but less messy looking? So you can, con you can kind of control the, the types of plants you put in, in terms of going wild. You can also control the way you plant them. Like you can, you can still plant in a, in a, in a very, you know, artful drift of, of perennials. You can have your perennials in groups. I do recommend planting some in groups, you know, like not just one bee bomb, but you can plant your, your, your red bee bombs in one area and your, you know, and your, your purple, your purple hyssop next to, you know, you can control the colors, you can do stuff like that. You can also, you know, you can clean up your edges a little bit. Um, mine is, you know, my neighbor actually came across the street and started to clean up the front of my yard one day because <laughs> he couldn't stand it. <laughs> but oh, I, um, you know, so uh, I, I understand the issue, but but there, there are definitely ways to, to sort of, you don't have to have leaves falling out of, of the beds all the time and stuff like that. You can, you can clean the edges. Um, and, and you can, you can organize your plantings in ways that are, that are quite artful. So Tia, I want to be respectful of you, your time, everyone else's time. Uh, I'll give you, let's go over three more minutes here. Uh, Mary asks, do gooseberries and currants provide for our birds and bees? Um, gooseberries and currants can supply, can offer food. There's, there's no question about that. The one thing, um, I would say is that currants are not native. I believe there are some native gooseberries. I'm not sure about gooseberries, but currants also um, are, are an alter. In Massachusetts, there are, you cannot plant black currants, I believe. There, currants are an alternate host for um, uh, pine rust, for a condition that, that's detrimental to our white pine trees. So I do not recommend currants. Um, there are, you know, there are actually some currants in our, in our uh, sanctuary in Lincoln. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm considering more and more that we should probably take them out. But um, because currants are an alternate host for at least some of the currants. And, and that, if you want more information on that, go to the, go to the MDAR website and, and put in currants and, and they'll tell you. Uh, 
Uh, Hugh, this is more of a comment, but maybe you can react to it. Uh, Hugh says to he's a fan of ground wood chips made by arborists. Um, is that something you would recommend? You know, I mean, we can have we we definitely local wood chips that are that are ground up. You know, that are chipped when an arborist comes and removes a tree, especially if they're removing a tree on your facility. No reason not to keep those those wood chips and use them. Um, I, I'm not a fan of of you know, brought in anything just because it, it can introduce other other issues. It can introduce pathogens. Mm -hmm. Not not highly likely, but there you go. But certainly if somebody's cutting something on your yard in your landscape and, and you want to keep those wood chips, then go for it. All right. So we're going to wrap it there. Um, Catherine, uh, you had multiple questions that I wasn't able to get to, so I do apologize, but we got to several of them. Uh, I want to thank uh, several libraries who helped um, us promote the program. Um, that includes Williamstown, West Newberry, Peabody, Medfield, Groton, Drake, at Danvers, Georgetown, Haverhill, Newburyport, Concord, and Clinton. Also want to thank the, uh, oh, and most importantly, want to thank the Ashland Library and also the Tewksbury Garden Club for helping spread the word. Uh, there's a lot of nice comments in the chat, Tia. Um, Tanya says, thank you. Rochelle says, thank you for hosting this presentation. And thank you, Tia, for all the great information. I learned so much. I'm doing some things correctly already and can now do even more. Uh, and Sherry says, thank you. Hugh says, thank you, Tia. Uh, he found it wonderful. So we will wrap it there. Uh, Tia, do you have any last words for the group? Uh, no, just, just uh, you know, have fun with it. It's, don't if, if if anything seems too much of a chore, then 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 back up and 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 take a take a broader view. <laughs> All right, so Tia, thank you so much. We're going to see Tia in two months. Uh, she'll be back in August uh, to give a talk about um, how we can coexist and 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 live with. Um, uh, uh, I believe it's is it animals, uh, Tia. Yeah, is that, living with yes. wildlife living with wildlife in Massachusetts. All right, so uh, you'll have information about that, plus the link to this recording, plus a link to a feedback survey uh, emailed to you, uh, if not later today, uh, then first thing tomorrow. So thank you all so much, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks again, Tia. Thank you, Robert. Bye.